persistence and teaching kids persistence and teaching kids to move forward and like not give up. But in doing that, we're not teaching them to value their strengths and really hone their strengths. And so then you get out into the real world and you can't value it. You don't know how to value it. Like before you even start focusing on what your passions are and what you are like, what you want to do, what's going to bring you joy. I think you really need to value in yourself, like what you are good at. Sun is coming up, are you ready to go? We can take a ride, we can take it slow. Yo. So what do you think, like, how do we decondition this or unlearn that like, for lack of a better phrase, like doing what you love isn't safe or possible to earn like a valuable or a good enough living. How do we unlearn that? I think some of it is really conditioned from school. And I'll, I'll give you a really good example. When I work with someone, if I get a new client, we will do a lot of diving into their story. Like the first two or three sessions is just them telling me all these different stories of where they are. I will ask questions that will elicit like new stories that I hadn't heard. And as they go through that process, I become very, it becomes very clear what their strengths are. Mm -hmm. And I will always stop. And when I notice a strength, ask them about it. Do you know that you are a gifted writer? Do you know that you are really good at mediating uh, tensions within your office? Do you know X, Y, Z, whatever that strength is? And almost inevitably, the person will get really quiet and kind of look at me, not in a, oh, that's awesome. In more of a like, I don't know that I'm going to take you at face value because mm -hmm. what happens when we are kids is that when you're good at something, if you're good at math, let's say you're great at math, but you're not good at spelling. When someone reads your report card, when the teacher reads your, your tells your parents about your report card, when you read the report card, when your parents talk to you about it, everyone is going to say, that's great that you got that A in math, but you could try harder on spelling. And we spend all of this time as our kid, to, like just being reminded over and over again, hey, that's nice, that thing that came easily to you, but the thing you need to work on is this. And the thing you need to focus on is this. I was telling this, um, I was talking about this with another podcaster who is extremely bubbly and vivacious. And she laughed. She's like, you know, what was always on my report card. I was like, what? She's like, everyone always said I need to stop talking as much. <laughs> and no, she didn't. She needed to stop talking as much in class because it was driving her teacher crazy. But that chattiness she has built into an amazing career. And we don't, as children, have the ability to process what they are telling us with that level of awareness and understanding of like the context. So your teachers keep telling you, you need to stop being chatty in class. You don't take that as, Hey, you need to like let other kids learn, but this is wonderful about you. Instead, you start disassociating yourself from it. And you stop valuing it as much because we spend so much time focusing on persistence and teaching kids persistence and teaching kids to move forward and like not give up. But in doing that, we're not teaching them to value their strengths and really hone their strengths. And so then you get out into the real world and you can't value it. You don't know how to value it. It becomes easily to you. And the funny thing is, is one of the ways I find out what my client's strengths are is I listen to what annoys them about other people in their office, because the things that annoy them about those people, a lot of times, not all the time. So you get like, you know, if it's a really bad coworker, it doesn't say anything much about them, but if it's just something little, a lot of times it's because that person doesn't have the same strength as they do. And they're not viewing it as a strength of theirs. They're viewing it as something that everyone should have. And they don't because that's not how we 
That's not how we learn. That's not how we are. We all have our own <laughs> strengths. And so to get started in this, like, I just feel like it's so important. Like before you even start focusing on what your passions are and what you are like, what you want to do, what's going to bring you joy. I think you really need to value in yourself, like what you are good at, what you bring to the table, because a lot of times the more you can even just get in touch with the fact that that is what makes you strong and great, the more you're able to articulate your value to others and start at least moving yourself in the direction of what you want. Because if you're not really embracing your strengths, you could know what your passion is, but you're still going to do it. The negative self-talk of like, yeah, but I still need to do this. I still need to do that. <laughs> so I really want to hear about the clarity journal, but there's also like, I have so many questions about the, the last thing you just said, um, just because I'm really interested in how the pandemic has really like changed this whole, I have a horrible boss. I can't get away from my horrible negative coworker. Like, has it changed anything that you've seen on like a wider scale for people in the workplace and I get at, at the work from home place? You know, it hasn't changed as much as I thought it would. Hmm. I would have thought that if you had more space from your bad boss, that you would complain about it less. Um, mm. That it wouldn't feel as oppressive. But on the other hand, it's now in your space. Like you're mm. now at home dealing with it. And I think that it, and in a lot of ways, it's just kind of shifted a bit, but bad bosses are still pinging you every 10 seconds on Slack or whatnot. And I mean, it really depends on what we're talking about by bad. Usually when I'm thinking bad, I'm thinking micromanager. Cause for some mm -hmm. reason that is the challenge that comes up the most with the most of my clients. I mm -hmm. have no statistical proof that that is actually the number one problem in the workforce, but it is definitely the number one problem for, in the workforce for my clients. And, you know, a micromanager is going to figure out a way to micromanage you pretty much no matter what. And it's almost more jarring when you're just like kind of beavering away quiet. I'm like doing my work and all of a sudden you're pinging me. And I think also, you know, a lot of people are stuck at home or had been stuck at home with their families. Mm -hmm. And so that added a layer of stress too. And so if you're being micromanaged by your boss at the same time, you're actually dealing with your kids. I think that makes people want to go. I mean, I think that truly is crazy, crazy making. <laughs> yes. I, I don't personally work in corporate America anymore, but my husband does. And just, he's a manager and seeing all of the trials and tribulations that his team has gone through, especially the ones who have children, young children, it's, it's been wild. And, and the hard part is that there's no change in expectation from, you know, upper right. management. There's no like, oh, you're, it should be easier for you to work. But a lot of people really, really struggled. And, um, you know, communicating that is really, really challenging. And, and now, and all we, all we're hearing is we've got a lack of productivity now that people are working from home, got to get people back into the office. And it's like, okay, well, maybe there's a bigger picture thing. So what does self-love mean to you? Self-love means to be non-judgmental of yourself, to be able to mm. see what's going on and let go of that negative voice. Um, someone recently called it the, what did they say? Oh, it's, I'm, I forget, but it, it's like a roller coaster you put yourself on of just all of this stuff. And it's not real. What's real is that love and that wholeness that there is in there. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Taka, if people are hashtag obsessed with you, where can they find you? Share all of the goods. You can find me at Becca Ribbing, B-E-C-C-A, Ribbing, R-I-B-E-C, sorry, I've like messing up my own name. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Like, that's not how you spell that's that. That's not how you spell that. That was really <laughs> funny. I've never done that on air before. Okay. 
Becca's B E C C A. I'm going to do it. I part it's because I was going so slow because I'm trying to let people write, but I'm not going to. So Becca's B E C C A ribbing is R I B B I N G. And you can find the clarity journal at Amazon. Amazing. Well, Becca, this has been such a joy and such a pleasure. Do you have any final parting words that you feel called to share with the community? I think also a big part of self-love is loving your future self and getting started now in wherever you are on this journey and whatever you need to do to learn so that you're setting your future self up to be happier. Mm, thank you. That was beautiful. I, I received that. Why are you talking directly to me today? <laughs> I feel like we need to have a like trigger warning for you <laughs> on the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> trigger. <laughs> Paul is going to be triggered on this episode. <laughs> yeah. So Paul is triggered on every episode, but this one even more so. Um, <laughs> Becca, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. Any, everyone who's listening, go pick up her journal. Make sure to follow her. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.